This podcast frequently touches on and discusses topics, situations, and experiences including mental illness, death, suicide, abuse, self-injurious behavior, and other potential content that may cause distress to listeners. Please do not continue listening if you feel you will be negatively impacted by this content. If at any time you find yourself in a crisis situation, please contact the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Additional resources have been included in the show notes. Welcome to Season 1 of the Unsung Battles Podcast. I'm Ian Anderson, and I'm on a mission to understand the tactics and the truths that men use to overcome their darkest days. Just like your physical body, your mental strength needs to be trained and developed. Everyday men fight battles against personal tragedies, mental illness, addiction, suicide, injustices, and other seemingly insurmountable obstacles. By sharing the power in these stories, I believe they will fortify our minds and encourage the bond of brotherhood. Whether you're listening for yourself or in an effort to help another, men capable of winning in mental combat are needed. So let's get to work. Welcome to the first episode of the Unsung Battles podcast. I'm Ian. Wanted to throw out a quick thank you for taking some time out of your day to look into this podcast and this effort around men's mental health. If you haven't already, please follow, subscribe. That'll give you notifications for future episodes that we drop. This podcast falls under a larger project known as Win Mental Combat. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, all of those at Win Mental Combat. And once again, just want to thank you as well as your patience as we go through this learning curve of standing up a new podcast. We'll continue to get better with every episode. With that said, let's jump into the first one. Javier has been awesome to jump on and kind of run me through the interview process. And and we'll start with, um, kind of start with my experience. Felt like if I'm going to be asking all these men for their their personal, you know, stories of difficulty in these really impactful phases of their life, that I should be willing to do that as well. So. We're going to kick this off and Javier is going to run the discussion, run the interview here, and we'll see what we get out of it. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to this. I have a lot of respect for you as a person and also what you're doing with this podcast and kind of the community you're trying to build. So I think it's incredibly brave to get on here and and share your experience and, and what kind of inspired you to start this podcast. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of get your perspective on a lot of these things. Oh man, you don't, you don't have to butter me up. I'm already here. I said, yes. <laughs> uh, technically I'm the one who said yes. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> well, um, I think we'll, we'll start with kind of the high level basic question. Um, maybe you can give us a rundown of, you know, what would you like people to know about yourself? Maybe some of your background, what made you decide to start this podcast, kind of your personal experiences that inspired you pretty open-ended question. So you can kind of take it where you want to. Um, growing up childhood was, was pretty good. Like didn't have too many intense experiences or kind of out of the norm type stuff. Getting into middle school, high school, my parents divorced um, which I've always felt like I got pretty lucky because they handled that super well compared to other parents that I've seen. About middle school, high school is when I first started struggling with depression. And at first, like, I just thought it was normal. Like, that's just how life was for everybody and everybody was better at it than me. But did not enjoy high school growing up those years of my life. Just had kind of a crappy experience with other people, with relationships. But what got me through that and something that's kind of at my core was I found a really good sports team, a cross country team that laid the foundation for me to kind of have mental resilience or go, getting through difficult times. Um, kind of turned down to be a bit of a second family for me. So getting out of high school, getting out of childhood stuff, went to college, wasn't really my thing, started not going to classes, ended up stepping back, um, left kind of this academic scholarship on the table because I couldn't get myself to classes and whatnot. Started working full time, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Decided military was the route I wanted to go, um, but because of depression and being on medication and and some other things, they kept all telling me no. So, through some experiences there, I ended up 
going on a LDS mission um, lasted about two months <laughs> before I came back early, which was an interesting experience. From there, tried going the military route again, and I got lucky, found a good recruiter that was willing to put in a waiver for me and do the work that needed to be done in order for me to get into and experience the military. So I went into the Air National Guard for five years, and about two years of that was full-time um, active duty, just training. And then from there, came back, started going to school, kind of refound what I was wanting to do for work. Um, in the HR field and went back to school and graduated with my bachelor's there. Since then, just kind of trying to figure out uh, life and what to do with it and all those fun little questions. It's kind of a little more in depth than I planned on going, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. So I think a lot of us, we tell our story like that, where it started off bad and then I went and did some things and now life is a little bit more stable and better. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of us end our story, right? Um, at this point in your life, how do you feel about life now compared to you know your early 20s or even high school years? I'd say early 20s, high school years. I mean, there's just a lot of ebbs and flows through life, right? Like I, you know, I kind of mentioned how you start kind of down and then you get a better understanding and you kind of build on that as you go. And I feel like mine's been a lot of peaks and valleys of figuring out what I think I need to do or what I want to do and then have those plans not work out and having to step back, reassess, find something different and move forward. But that early mindset or outlook, definitely a little more fatalistic and pessimistic. Um, these last couple of years have just been really kind of dark. I, I kind of hit this point where like my view of life was to just suffer through it. And that's all it was going to be. Like I'd kind of given up um, getting rid of depression or, you know, even just this, like people say managing their depression. So I kind of just got to this point where like, what was the point in the, I don't know, not to get too real too fast, but um, what I really struggled with was, is I've had a lot of really solid family and friendly relationships that have kept me here. And I can't put them through that, just stepping away. And so I kind of just resigned myself to, all right, Mike, I'll just go as long as I can go and we'll, we'll see what happens. So it's been a, been a lot of different things, been a lot of different outlooks on life um, over the years, but that's kind of ballpark where they've been, where I'm at. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So is that your standard operating procedure right now of just going as long as you can, um, how you are? Or do you have a different philosophy now? Um, I'm trying. So I kind of got to that point of that was my operating philosophy where I'm just enduring as long as I can endure uh, so that other people don't have to go through the experience of me kind of stepping out. With that being my standard operating procedure of just enduring, I was always looking for this reason, this purpose, um, this you know, explanation as to why life just was not a good experience to live in general. And the only thing that I could ever seem to come up with was that it had to be to help somebody else. Like there was something behind going through this that couldn't be avoided. And the only way that I was going to get to what that was, was going through this experience. And it sounds a little melodramatic when I say it out loud, but I kind of just got to where the only explanation I had for why I was going through this darkness was to help others get through their darkness. So to change gears a little bit, yeah. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, what type of advice would you give yourself? I'd probably say opening up about it earlier and finding solid relationships that I could lean on in those times of need were, were pretty crucial. Cause I feel like there were a lot of ways when I was much younger that I coped unhealthily with depression. And I think some of that could have been avoided by having conversations up front and letting people know what I was going through and finding the right people that want to help you work towards a solution, but at the same time are understanding and have experience of what you're going through. So when you mentioned when you were in high school, your cross-country team, 
uh, and the support system and camaraderie that was built there really helped you kind of get through those difficult years. Mm -hmm. uh, today, Ian, do you have a support system that you lean on in a similar way? And, and if so, how did you go about finding those people and, and building that support system? Before diving into that selfless or selfish plug here, but my hope is that eventually that's what win mental combat can be for for folks, um, especially men that are going through some of these experiences. Um, I'm doing my best to try and craft a community and environment where individuals that are facing those experiences and don't feel like they have that support system can jump in and hopefully integrate quickly and have that network and tools. So I got really lucky that way. I have a pretty stellar family that's been been very supportive and they've each had some of their own challenges. But even more so, you know, you mentioned the cross country team. There's there's a handful of guys from that team that have remained part of my support system pretty much my entire life. I can't overemphasize how important it was to have people like that in your life that are genuinely wanting your, the best for you, but at the same time, giving you the opportunity to open up and experience and share what's going on inside. You know, the cross country team was kind of like my second family. And even today, um, there, there, there are people that I lean on and, and turn to because I've been in places without that support structure. And I think those are very, two very clear examples of that are when I went on my mission and when I went to, I moved to, after I graduated college, moved to Minnesota to super awesome job opportunity. But both of those experiences, I stepped away from that support system and it, it just, it wasn't possible for me to operate in that environment. No, that's great. So it sounds like you were able to keep ties with a lot of uh, people from that original support system you had. Um, so one thing that I meant to ask you about, but you just brought up and jogged my memory, uh, was about coming home early from your LDS mission. So for those listeners who may not be like super familiar with that, it's uh, an LDS mission is when a young man, what, 18 now, 19 when we were doing it, um, they go somewhere for two years. I went to Costa Rica, um, other people go across the United States or whatever, and you proselyte, teach about doctrine of the church and things like that. There is a very harsh stigma uh, for people who come home from those missions early, particularly yeah. men who come home from missions because it's optional for women. Uh, but there's very much a non-optional culture in the LDS church for men to go on missions. It's considered an obligation and a duty. So when you come home early, there's a lot of stigma, uh, a lot of sense of this person failed. They uh, they're wrapped up in some sort of quote unquote sin uh, or they just couldn't hack it, right? They're just too weak to do it. And there's a lot of shame that goes along with that as the person who returns home uh, early. What was your experience like? And you, you can go into as much detail as you'd like, but what was your experience like dealing with that kind of cultural stigma of the church? Because uh, I think even if you're not LDS and coming home from a mission early, there's still a lot of stigma in every religion about how you're expected to conduct yourself. And if you fall with it, outside of those parameters, um, it can be a really jarring experience. Um, so anyway, I'd love to hear what your experience was like. Yeah. Well, and it's, man, it's tough because there's just so many complexities and layers to this coming home early, the mental illness stuff, um, even, like you said, even within this religion and others. Um, what was really hard for me and I've even caught myself doing it at times when I've heard uh, missionaries come home early. It's like, oh, like, I wonder why, like, you know, could they not hack it? Or what was, what was the reason kind of behind it all? And catching myself doing that, even though I've been through it is really frustrating to me. From my experience, I felt a lot of those stigmas were most built up in my own mind. I was so wrapped up in what is everybody else thinking about me because I came home early that that stuff be it becomes real experience, even though it's not necessarily happening. So for instance, when I came back, like I stopped going to my home ward because I just didn't want to answer the questions. And like, they already know, you know, I don't need to be there to, to talk through it. And one of the struggles that I faced was I kept feeling this need to 
I don't know if justify is the right word, but like explain or make them understand why I couldn't stay there any longer. Like I just, cause I wanted them to know, like, it's not like this was some easy decision. Like I can, <laughs> it's so, I don't know, even now, right now, like I'm feeling this, this want or desire to justify what I was experiencing to try and explain how difficult it was so that it doesn't feel like me coming home was an excuse. And that's where this, this struggle with return missionaries who came back early, I think happens is a lot of that goes within their mind, but also with what other people think. The question was never, did you serve a mission? The question was always, where did you serve your mission? And I had gotten myself through, cause I didn't go until I was 21. And normally it's like you said, like 19 or even now 18. I had gotten myself through that, like, I'm okay with not going. It doesn't feel right for me. And to then go at 21 and then only to come back early was just incredibly frustrating when I got back to college. And I went to UVU and BYU up in Utah County where it's very heavily LDS population. And again, you have those expectations. And where I struggled was girls would always ask, where did you serve your mission? And it was always just like, as soon as I broke, as soon as we breached that, that subject internally, I was telling myself, like, I don't measure up to their standards. So I might as well just stop talking to them now because that is the expectation. It sounds like the experience you had was a lot of like self-doubt, a lot of self-criticism and how does this impact my value and my worth overall, but definitely to my community or to potential like romantic partners. And I think you're right. I think every, I think everyone must, who comes home early must struggle with that, that idea of like, how does this affect my value now? And the answer is it doesn't. I think that concept of having that internal doubt and that internal dialogue uh, is hard. It's super hard, especially in a community where you as a, as a boy and a young man is conditioned into this idea of like, to be a good, valuable member of this church and member of this community, you go and you serve. And if you don't do that, then you're kind of like a second class man. <laughs> and the women, the, the women in a lot of ways are conditioned to have that expectation as well of like, I want to marry a return missionary. I date return missionaries. So if you don't fall with that, within that, you automatically don't make the cut. And I think it's a little bit different now than it was. Yeah, it's gotten you know, better. 10 years ago. But yeah, that's tough. And and like I said, that's a very specific LDS church culture and stigma and expectation. But I think if you look at any congregation, any church, uh, any parish, whatever it might be, whatever you belong to, I think you'll find that there are a lot of expectations and stigma and cultures that can feel really confining. And if you fall outside of those, you start questioning, what is my worth and what is my value at this point? Um so anyway, yeah, thank you for sharing that. What what are you doing to kind of continue this uh, commitment you have to, you know, spiting depression or, you know, uh, whatnot? What are, what are the steps that you're taking to, uh, you know, win mental combat? The biggest one that is kind of the catalyst for everything else is finally making that decision to go all in. Because I've I got to the point where it's like, look, like this can't continue. I can't live my life like this. And I'd always had this little conversation going on in the back of my mind of what I should be doing or what I should be trying. Um, and I would always kick that out as a, like, I'm not ready or I'm not, I'm not strong enough to do that yet. And so it finally got to the point where something had to change. And so going all in, um, I started looking up YouTube videos and trying to understand like my body's natural cycles and reactions for the day. And so I started crafting a routine of like, okay, this is, this is who I want to be. Um, and this is what that person would do. Part of the, kind of the screw you to depression is just like turning off my reactions to my feelings. I, I don't know how to explain it other than I've taken this approach where everything that I'm feeling or thinking is now a lie to me and whatever I act on, that's a truth. I may feel terrible, but I've decided to screw depression. So I don't care how I feel and I'm going to try and get up. And I'm going to try and get moving and I'm trying to make as many decisions as I can before the time for that decision comes. 
for instance, when I'm waking up, like I've already decided like this is what is going to happen. And I try to give myself as little amount of time to feel or to think on those decisions as possible. Because as soon as I start opening up to how I feel, that's when I start getting weighed down more and more and more and more. And that's not to say that I'm doing this perfectly or um, every day because I've had days where it's still jacked up and I don't get out of bed and, you know, it just, they end up rough days, but it's helped me start making progress and giving me some momentum to making other decisions, getting up and exercising first thing in the morning, um, kind of pairing that with like your body's natural cycles, as well as what physical activity does for you, both mentally and like how you feel. It's something that like, I don't, I don't give myself as much as possible. I don't give myself days off anymore. Like it used to be like, okay, I'll wake up early and work out. And then on the weekend I can take it easy and I can work out middle of the day and all that other jazz. And it's kind of just gotten to this mindset of like, like I can't afford to give it any room to have its effect on me. Cause as soon as I stop doing one of those routines or activities, I start to fumble. Um, a, one thing that I set up was I set up a daily and a nightly review form where basically I go through and I answer questions about my day. Cause I want to know based on whatever little data I can collect, what's working and what's not working. So I track like, how good was my sleep? How many hours of sleep did I have? Do I feel like today matters? Do I want to live tomorrow? So I'll ask myself all these different questions and some of them are to build data, but others are to prime myself to have a better day. I have a couple of, I guess you could call them affirmations at the end of the daily review where I say, uh, true or false, I am going to respect the man that I'm going to be today, or today will matter, or today I'm going to take steps to fulfill my purpose. And so I'm trying to prime myself as much as possible by answering true to those. And as well as like the nightly one, going back and reviewing like what actually happened and getting information on did I actually follow through with what I said I was going to do in the morning? And I also crafted it to where I have these mental health questions. I'm asking myself, like, did depression severely impact my day? Do I want to live tomorrow? And if I answer no to some of these, then it has a prompt in there where it's like, okay, like you're at a state where you need to reach out to somebody because letting it go on any further is just going to dig you further into a hole. I'm trying to set up as many of the decisions, as many of the experiences as I can in advance. So there's no question or time that I have to step aside and start having that internal battle with depression. I've done all I can do to kind of try and outmaneuver it, I guess. I think it's incredible how intentional you are uh, about confronting the your mental illness and your depression. I've never heard of anyone using uh, a form to collect data on how they're feeling throughout the day. That's awesome. Is that is that form something that you would be like willing to share? I think that would be really cool to give as a resource. Yeah, so peek under the hood. And I don't know if there's people that are interested in this and it would be beneficial to them. Definitely open to moving this up in the timeline. But what I would love to do and kind of a sneak peek as to some of the things that I'm hoping that will come out of Win Mental Combat is eventually I would love to have some kind of app on your phone where you can go through and have these daily and nightly questionnaires where you get to pick, okay, these are the things that I'm struggling with or I want to do or that I want to track as well as kind of like those basic necessities of sleep. How did you sleep? How do you feel your day was? You know, um, and my hope is that by giving that as a resource that this can potentially be beneficial to others as well. Right now I'm just using Google Forms, so it's easy to kick out and and they can kind of go through it and even copy it and make their own. So so to go back to what you're saying, uh, you mentioned uh, you don't have perfect execution, right? That there are some days where it's still hard to get out of bed and, and whatnot. Um, I, I think it's really easy for your internal critic to start chiming in on days like that. What is your like internal dialogue like on your best of days and, and maybe your worst of days? <laughs> um, best of days, a couple of the things that have been standing out as kind of on repeat in my mind is one of them is how you do anything is how you do everything and trying to embody that even for just simple stuff is like tossing something on my bed instead of putting it away. Like how I do anything is how I do everything. So that's getting me to make those little decisions. 
so on the best of days, it's more, how far can we go? You know, how, how much can I get done now? Because I know that the difficult times are going to hit. And sometimes I think that might be a little bit of a detriment that it leads to burnout. But what I've learned to do is when I am doing well, I do as much as I can and get as much as I can in because I know days are coming where it's not going to be that great. Because on the worst of days, I feel like you could pick any disparaging comment <laughs> you wanted and it would have, it's gone through my mind. Um, on the worst of days, that self-talk is like, why are you here? There's no purpose. Like you're not making any impact or difference. Like you could step away and nothing would change and people would go on with their lives. Yeah. They'd be sad for a little bit, but you know, and a lot of the times it turns into like, if this is all it's for, like, I don't want this. I don't want it. Like logically, doesn't it make sense to just kind of step out because the option is to just continue to suffer. If there's nothing good coming out of that suffering, then why would I keep doing it? And I think that's what's been really helpful about this project is finding a purpose in the suffering. Um, because for me, that external impact is really meaningful and motivating and something that I've realized helps me. So in those moments where you have a really harsh inner critic, do you have any tactics for how you handle it in those moments? Some people say they, they sit with it. Some people argue back and say, no, you're wrong. Has any of that or anything worked for you? Yeah. One of my favorites at the moment is I found some motivational videos on YouTube that, you know, they've got some inspiring music and they're just a bunch of motivational speeches that have been cut up and pieced together. And so what I do is I'll put headphones in because I, that's low effort. I can manage to get headphones in and turn on a video. Like that's very low cost of energy. And what I do is I start repeating what I'm hearing in these videos because like I said before, my, my feelings, my thoughts, those are all lies now. And so I don't want to listen to those in order to be who I want to be. So I have to listen to something else and I have to reprogram that voice in my head. So that's something that I'm trying to work on is if I'm not having a good moment and I'm not combating it effectively in my mind, that internal critic, it's time to listen to somebody else. And so blasting those motivational speeches and repeating that usually goes a long way. And sometimes I've even had it get enough of motivation that I can get up and start doing what I know I want to do or need to do. I kind of already talked about the other one, but it's, it's making decisions beforehand before those moments come and deciding that even the little things matter. Like something as simple as I no longer, I used to, I work a lot from home and I used to wear gym shorts all the time, right? Because it's just more comfortable. I no longer allow myself to wear gym shorts because it makes it too comfortable for me, you know, just kind of be a lot less active or purposeful in my day. The other thing that I feel like has helped a lot, and this one might not be everybody's favorite to hear, but I felt that making things more difficult rather than making things easier has been more helpful for me. I feel like so much of the the advice or the everybody's two cents is, you know, you're going through such a difficult time with this mental illness, like make things easier, make it more doable, the little wins, all that jazz, right? And for me, what I found is I kept reducing my load till I wasn't bearing anything. And it just made things worse because not only was I feeling terrible, but I was doing nothing. And that led back into me feeling more terrible because what's the point? Like I'm not contributing. And so I think finding some weight to bear to give you some of that traction and responsibility, just finding something external or responsibility, whatever it may be to add enough of that load that you get some traction. Um, and that can kind of give you some, I don't know, motivation, responsibility to, to push past those difficult critic moments. So if I heard you right, the, General advice is make things easier for yourself, take on less responsibility. And you're saying what's helped you is finding something that has held you accountable in some way where you've had yeah. to get out of bed and you've had to do something because other people yeah. were counting on you. And I've even gone so far, like might be a stupid reason, but um, to try to look at opportunities to manufacture hardship in my day. So something that I do now in the mornings is after I finish like 
shower and, and all that jazz clean in, in warm water, I'll turn it to super cold water and I'll force myself to stand in it because I feel like that's me practicing how to get through a difficult moment. And that's me preparing for when those difficult bouts of depression hit to make hard decisions and do what doesn't feel like I want to do. I don't know if that's necessarily helpful to everybody, but finding those opportunities to make things a little bit harder and a little bit more challenging where I'm in the right mood and blowing past that, I feel like gives me the momentum for those bouts of depression as well. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I kind of, I don't know how this fits into the conversation, but I wanted to talk a little bit about like this experience where I lost hope because I felt like that was a really crucial crossroads for me. So came out of the military and started going back to college kind of just to set the scene. And I, it was the time that I was the most confident. I was really physically fit. I'd gone off, had these experiences. I was coming back to college. I was doing really well academically. I was doing really well physically. Um, but internally and mentally, I was just falling apart. And it just got to this point of overwhelming darkness to the point where like I couldn't sleep at night. So I would drive around town just, just bawling and I couldn't shut it off. I got to the point where I would spend all my nights up just trying to get to sleep and deal with what I was going through that I couldn't wake up and go to classes. There were days where I woke up in the afternoon and I had missed <laughs> all of my classes for the day. You know, it just kind of was this like, oh, like Ian isn't as committed, you know, where he's not showing up to class and and just doesn't have that responsibility. And and there's just so much going on that that isn't seen and to the point where I couldn't even function or get through some of these nights without without like cutting into my arms and it became almost this routine of like what i had to go through just to to survive another night and eventually i i graduated i got this super awesome job um up in minnesota working for a fortune 500 company you know hr development program all these great awesome things were happening externally and i left my support system I moved up there in the middle of winter and just started plugging away as best I could. And my point in telling this story is, is just like, you never know what's going on in somebody's life or the level or extent that it's happening. Um, I got really lucky in that I had one of these uh, members from this cross country team that I was talking to, as well as a friend that I met in college that had built up a relationship with me that I felt comfortable enough letting them know what was going on to the point where like that suicidal ideation wasn't just ideation anymore. And <laughs> shoot, man, I'm trying not to get emotional. Um, I got to the point where not like I had kind of always had like a short plan, right? Like if I had to do it, this is how I was going to do it. And when I knew it got to the point where something was really wrong is I was no longer thinking of my family as the reasons not to do it, but I was mentally going through the process of how do I write that letter to explain and make it okay. And <laughs> I just, I don't know, man, like it was, I can't explain or put into words what those moments are like, but at the core of this whole project, right? This gosh dang it. <laughs> Sorry. Um just to pause for a second. Ian, it is okay to get emotional. There is <laughs> nothing wrong with that. I know. And I like mentally, like logically, I know that, right? But doing it, like I've always tried to reserve those emotions because I wanted to feel in control of them. And people you know, they talk about stigmas and all these other things, but I think the biggest stigma that we have out there is the ones that we put on ourselves. So I'll do my, I'll do my best to, to be okay with that, but your best is enough. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, but I guess why I want to, to bring that up is I want to, at the core of this project is trying to find the men that are going through those moments. And I felt like I was lucky enough 
to have a friend, two friends actually that that cared enough and got me to stick around. I can't look back on my life since then and say that there's been some dramatic change or suddenly it's easier. And just at the core of this project and the, the real why behind this whole thing is trying to find those moments and give them that little piece that'll make the difference, if at all possible. So it ended up working out. I was in the hospital for a couple days, got back out and realized that I needed my support system and had to step away from that job. And, and what was really difficult about coming out of all that is having to step away from that position that was this great opportunity. You know, all these external things going right and feeling like I couldn't, I couldn't hack it to, to stick it out for this opportunity. But I knew at that point, like I had to have a support system back. And so I came back here and had to restart over and, and I lost, I lost that hope that life was going to get any better. And I stopped acting like I had any power to make things better. Um, I put on weight. Um, I stopped putting in the extra effort at work or to grow or to develop. I stopped reading. I stopped just all these different things. And for me, this this project has been what's brought the fire back. I, I don't know. I just reached this point where it's like things aren't going to feel better. But if I can at least do something good with it, maybe that'll make it worth it. I think there's like, I think there's a lot to say about that pressure that you have felt to succeed on paper, like externally, like you had a great job, great title, you graduated, you were doing well. And on paper, everything looked great. I think everyone, especially men feel this pressure to succeed outwardly, to make it very apparent that I'm successful. I'm stable. I make money, um, yada, yada, yada. And when you feel like you can't do that anymore, there's this really harsh shame that comes along with that, that you, you somehow, you couldn't hack it or you failed. You're somehow less of a man. And I think one thing that's really helped me is understanding what giving a hundred percent looks like that it's a hundred percent is a moving target for me. Like some days my hundred percent is some people's thousand percent. There are things I can move mountains on my best day, giving a hundred percent. And some days my hundred percent is not anywhere close to that. My hundred percent is a normal person's 5%, right? It is, I am moving grains of rice with that hundred percent, but keeping in mind that that's still my hundred percent and I can still feel real good about that. Real proud that I gave a hundred percent, even though it's nowhere near uh, what yesterday's hundred percent was. And for me, that's taken a lot of like the pressure of giving a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time off. I'm like, I can give a hundred percent and it doesn't look the same. Right. And we've also talked a lot about this stigma that we put on ourselves based on what kind of other people expect from us. And I think there's a lot of value in disregarding what other people think of you and what they, how they might react to your decisions. Right. So anyway, I think that was an awesome explanation of, I think that was a very vulnerable um, description of what your experience has been like, and that cannot have been easy. I think that's the point we have to get to. And I mean, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but along with, as you're saying, reducing those stigmas and, and no longer, you know, putting that pressure on yourself of what everybody thinks. I think a lot of this, this podcast, these conversations, these interviews is going to be it's going to be men experiencing those those opportunities of vulnerability and and I just feel like what we're doing as a society isn't working, right? Like the numbers are too high. They feel insurmountable. The progress that needs to be made in in the realm of men's mental health and I by sharing these experiences and why this podcast exists is sharing these experiences so that those vulnerabilities can start to open up those conversations for others. I mean, Hopefully that's that's what comes out of it. But I agree, man. It's it's tough and it's hard because I look back and 
And even now, I feel like there's a lot of moments in my life that I built up around me to be these great things. So like I'm going on a mission for two years to Armenia. I'm going to learn this language. I'm going to do all this stuff while I came home early. Okay. Well, how do I pick myself back up? What do I do now? Okay. Well, I'm going to go into the military. I'm going to learn Arabic. I'm going to work for this three-letter agency. I'm going to do all these things. Okay. Well, I failed as a linguist. So what do I do now? All right. Well, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to work on my degree. I'm going to be this like HR leader, da, 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 da. And I end up coming home early from that job. What I hope others take from it is, is don't stop trying. Like just because you don't get the outcome that you want, don't let that be the reason that you don't try something else. Cause you never know, right? Like failure is always on the table and it wouldn't be worth doing if it wasn't. But I don't know, man, like how do you, how do you keep going when your, your life plan or whatever you set in stone that you're going to do doesn't work out. And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm trying to figure it out. I don't have the answer to that either. I don't think anyone, I don't think, I think this is very similar to medication where there's not a one size fits all. There's not some magic thing that we can all do that we don't feel like failures anymore. But I think it very much ties into your idea of what we're doing now as a culture, as a society isn't working. Um, I just listened to this podcast with Gabor Mate, and he was explaining that um, uh, when you are studying microorganisms, you put them in a in like a broth so that they they grow and you can study them. It's called a culture. And if those microorganisms start dying or getting sick, it's considered a toxic culture. So that's how you you know if like the broth and that culture that you put in is is toxic or not. And and he says the fact that we are having more and more mental illnesses, more and more suicides, we're, ha- we're seeing more and more of these problems is indicative that as a society, we have a bad broth. We have a bad culture. We have a toxic culture. And it's not going to get better uh, by itself, at least. And I, I think that's really fascinating. Um, and... I was, <laughs> this is going to sound dumb, but I was watching this Instagram video uh, with the liver king. You know who that is? The bodybuilder who claimed that he got that uh, got his protein from raw liver and it turns out he was just on steroids. <laughs> I have never heard about this. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> but that's quite a claim. <laughs> yeah. But he was um, he was on a podcast with a comedian and I, I, I wish I could remember this comedian's name because he's great. Um, but they were talking to each other and the comedian – made this comment where he said, I think that the only way we connect as humans is through vulnerability that we, um, we, we idolize and we look up to people that we think are infallible, but we don't connect with them. We connect with the people who are fallible, right? Who are vulnerable. And I think you're right on the money as far as a a way to fix kind of the toxic culture that we're in or, you know, not just men, but particularly men's inability to um, find support and reach out for mental health problems, I think starts with vulnerability. And I think you've done a great job today setting the example of what it means to be vulnerable and the impact that that can have. Thanks, man. Well, I, I really appreciate you being willing to hop on and talk through this with me because that's those are experiences and answers that I wasn't going to get on my own. And I think that's part of this whole thing, right? Is you're not meant to do this by yourself. Like you hear all this talk about lone wolves and, and, you know, kind of, I'll go and do my own way. And, and I just think that's bull. Like, honestly, I, you look at how over time, like, men have functioned like we're we're always part of a tribe or a team or a group or a battalion or whatever it may be like we're meant to run off this this strengthening power of brotherhood at least that's my opinion and i think the quickest way to forge that is through like shared shared suffering or shared difficulty and a lot of that comes from being willing and vulnerable enough to open up to that. And I think we've lost a lot of the, we've lost a lot of the situation or environments where men would naturally be driven to have that, where, 
with technology, with cell phones, we're isolated, we're not talking as much, we're not going through physical experiences in person with each other. So, yeah, man, I hope that that is something this can contribute to. But the concept of of lone wolf is is kind of loadable because I think in even in real life, uh, lone wolves in actual wolf packs, I don't think are actually a thing. Can't imagine that there's a long term <laughs> long term lo- lone wolf that isn't miserable or is able to survive. Um, so my last question for you is just um, we've covered a lot. But we've kind of been all over the place, um, which is my <laughs> fault. But no, if you, you could, if you could sum up what the takeaway is from your message and, you know, a 10, 15 second soundbite, what would that be? I think if I could sum it all up, I'd say that despite what you're going through, there can be value in it. It might just not be the value you're looking for or that you want. And that shouldn't. I don't know. That shouldn't stop you from still seeking it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Really appreciate being invited on and to ask questions and have this experience with you. I think it's been awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to this first episode. If you found some value, some understanding, maybe even some hope, please share this out to the people that you care about in your life. Additionally, we'd love to get a rating from you. That helps us grow the podcast, learn what we can do better, and ideally find some more individuals that can benefit from these messages, these stories. And finally, we are always on the lookout for individuals that have stories that could make a significant contribution to this conversation. If you're aware of somebody like that, maybe even you yourself have been through something that you feel like could benefit others, love to hear from you. Please reach out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, All of those are going to be win mental combat. That's at win, W-I-N, mental combat. Love to hear from you. Looking forward to doing more of these episodes and continuing this conversation.